we, we got through it and uh, I didn't know how we were going to do things at late Saturday night when I tested positive, but um, we had the ability, the technology to come up with that. So that's that uh, was a blessing. Um, thank you for your prayers this week. Uh, the symptoms have been relatively mild. Uh, Julie hasn't caught it uh, thus far. <laughs> Um, but she does uh, feel a little bit under the weather um, with some sort of uh, cold or fluvy symptoms, but she's been testing every day and it's still been showing negative. So that's a blessing from that perspective, I guess. Um, and welcome to our visitors this morning, uh, our international visitor from Iran and... Uh, and also from, I've noticed a few faces here, welcome to our service this morning. We've been, we've been uh, looking at this, um, uh, this uh, area of uh, justification. We've been uh, working our way through Romans. We're now up to Romans 3. And um, we're, we're going to look at uh, just the last few verses of Romans 3 this morning. So... Uh, just a few verses from Romans chapter 3, commencing at verse 27. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Sorry about that. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Would you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come here this morning and come here to give you the adoration of our hearts. We can come here to worship you. And Lord, in our act of worship, as we open your word, we ask through the work of your Holy Spirit that you will speak to our hearts and teach us something afresh and remind us of the clarity of the gospel. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just going to have a sip first. So the question you might ask today, what is so important about being justified by faith alone? Why is Paul insisting that it's faith alone? We recall Martin Luther um, and, you know, we might say that, Martin Luther, aren't you going just a little bit far as well? Now, after all, Catholics also believe in salvation by grace. And I want, want to be clear this morning. Let's be clear, the Catholic Church does not teach that people are justified based on their own good works without any need of the redemptive activity of Christ. Of course, there are dramatic differences in how we define the activity of Christ. What Rome objects to is the concept of faith alone. Protestants believe that the instrument by which we are brought into a, a justified relationship with Christ is faith. So why do you insist that justif justification is by faith alone? Now, I've also mentioned Martin Luther's, Luther's answer. I, I mentioned this last week. Remember, he discovered that from Habakkuk 2, verse 4, he discovered that the just, or in, in some versions you'll read, the righteous shall live by faith. And Paul says similarly in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, which we looked at a number of weeks ago, the doctrine of the justification of, by faith is the very heart of the gospel of salvation. 
So without an adequate understanding of justification by faith, we will lack assurance. Sometimes even believers will have doubts concerning the blessed hope that we have, that Christians have, and we should confidently have and hold on to. So assurance is something that a Christian might struggle with from time to time. It's one of the things that I like to talk about with uh, people who are, are facing death. Do you still have the hope, that blessed hope in your heart? If your salvation is based on anything in you, of course, you will be unsettled. For the, doctor, the doctrine of justification by faith alone reminds us that our acceptance by God is grounded on nothing in us. Rather, it's grounded on something that has been done for us, that is outside of us, something that has been done by our Lord Jesus Christ. And we appropriate it and we receive it by faith. If you don't understand that, if you don't believe this, you'll never have a full and a complete assurance of your salvation. Your service for Christ will never be bold because you'll doubt the Father's love. Therefore, the doctrine of justification by faith is very important. The Apostle Paul in verse 28 tells us a couple of things that we should know. Paul says it's at the very heart of the gospel. Justification by faith alone isn't all there is, of course, to be in, in the Christian life and, and in Christian doctrine. But without this truth, nothing else matters. For without this truth, we're still in our sin. We're still under the judgment and condemnation of God. This truth, or this is the beginning of truth for our faith. And it's such an especially important truth because every Christian revival, and, and we can note a number of these revivals over the last 500 years since the Reformation, has been directly related to the preaching and teaching of a true understanding of the doctrine of justification by faith. And we need to be re reminded, because as believers, as we're suddenly confronted with the truth of this doctrine, that it liberates us. It liberates us from any apprehension of God's love toward us. It transforms us, and it transforms churches. And for people who are not Christians, as they're confronted with the truth of the of justification by faith and they're humbled by its presentation of the holiness of God and yet simultaneously they feel more loved and more comforted by the God of heaven and earth who indeed is a merciful God. <coughs> the result of being drawn to Christ and to become believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and to join his church. Therefore, the doctrine of justification by faith is a doctrine that we cannot afford to be ignorant of. So Paul says in verse 28, it's up on the, up, up there somewhere. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. The first thing that Paul says here is we conclude. By saying we conclude, it means that, that this isn't Paul's individual opinion. He doesn't say I conclude. He could have said, and he would have been right because he did maintain this truth, but he says here we conclude because he wants to stress two things. First, that this is something that all Christians know and understand and embrace. Christians conclude that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. <coughs> now, just to be sure, you might ask, well, what are the works of the law? Of course, we go back to uh, the law in the Old Testament. We go back to the Ten Commandments, and I'm sure that uh, most of you are familiar with the Ten Commandments. But he's also stressing that this isn't just simply a New Testament doctrine. Friends, this is a Bible doctrine. 
when we uh, saw the children's video there, we saw Hebrews uh, 11, 1 to 15, being kind of read out for us in a pictorial way. And it's a picture of the Old Testament patriarchs of faith. And so justification by faith has always been the me mechanism by which people are saved. And in emphasising this truth, uh, of course, uh, Paul goes back to Genesis. He goes back to the story of Abraham to prove that justification is by faith. And as we go th more through uh, the book of Romans, we'll see evidence of this. Paul wants to say, we conclude this truth because this isn't something new. This isn't, isn't a doctrine that I've just invented. This isn't my opinion alone because all Christians believe this and we believe this because firstly the Old Testament teaches it. This is what all believers know and understand that we're justified by faith. That is another word for justified is that we're made righteous uh, or we're declared righteous by faith. But the second thing is what justification means. When we say justification, we mean by justification that it's a de declaration by God that you are righteous because of Christ. It's God declaring you not guilty because of what Jesus Christ, his son, has done for you. When Paul, when Paul speaks of free justification, he's talking about God declaring to you to be righteous. Not making you righteous, not accepting you because you are righteous, but accepting you as righteous, declaring you to be righteous because of the righteousness of his son. Justification is God's act of free grace, free unmerited favour, where he pardons you of all your sins by declaring you as righteous and accepts you as being righteous. And it's not due to your own righteousness. The Bible declares or describes the righteousness of, <coughs> of people to be like filthy rags. Even the best of us, our righteousness is like filthy rags. That's how the Bible describes our own righteousness. But you're declared righteous because of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul emphasis is that justification is received by faith alone. He wants to drive home this truth to you. It's already said, but just in case you're not listening or you haven't heard clearly, he wants to drive it home again. Salvation is received as a free gift by faith alone. Paul is saying works have no part in your acceptance by God. Works have no part in your acceptance before God, not even works that God commands, not even works that that God, by his grace, enables you to do. And Paul is emphatic. God has established salvation for us and he's established salvation for us by grace from two aspects, from two sides. I want us to look at first, firstly at God's side. First, God met the demands of his own righteousness by establishing salvation for us by grace in Jesus Christ. He doesn't depend on what we do. He depends upon his own work and he depends upon the work of his own son. Now, from last week, we looked at verses 24 and 25. Could we just go down to the next slide? Verses 24 and 25, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because of his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Now, Paul uses two important words in this passage, in these two verses. He uses the words redemption and he uses the word 
propitiation. And that's a big word. It's even hard to, hard to pronounce. Now, these are two words that are, we don't use in normal conversation. Redemption refers to Jesus purchasing us back from the bondage of sin. Redeeming us out of our slavery to sin and the penalty that was due for it. Propitiation refers to Jesus turning away the just wrath of God against our sin. Therefore, Jesus accomplished salvation. We contributed, we contribute nothing to our salvation. It's by God's grace that a sacrifice was provided for us and for our sin. But God, from God's side, salvation is provided by grace. But it's not just God's side. Our salvation is provided by grace. This is the second half of the equation. Paul wants to emphasise that salvation purchased and accomplished by Jesus Christ is received by faith alone. And it's apart from the works of the law. Nothing we do influences God's grace. No obedience of ours moves God to show grace toward us. Nothing we do pr prompts the grace of God toward us. Furthermore, even our faith. If we have faith, it is a gift from God. God gives us the gift of faith to believe. Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 9 makes this clear. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Paul is telling us that everything salvation entails, including faith, is a gift from God. It's a gift of God. Paul often says in his letters, I thank God. As you read his letters, just look at the first few verses of each of his little epistles. I thank God for the faith that you have, he often says to the various people that he writes to, because it's God who is the author of faith. He gifts us with faith. So salvation is by grace from both sides. We can't do anything in order to condition God's acceptance of us. But the one thing that God requires of us is faith, which he freely gives to us anyway. So Paul is emphasising that salvation is by grace from the, from the beginning to the end on both sides of this equation, from God's side and from our side of the coin. And there is no work that we contribute to be accepted by God. If you think there's something that you must contribute to be accepted by God, you'll never understand the freeness of the Father's love or the costliness of the sacrifice um, that he's initiated for us in his son for us to be freed of the penalty of sin. In order to be justified, God commands that there's no work that, that any of us must do. The only works that have anything to do with our justification are the works of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Paul wants to make that absolutely clear, that we're not accepted by God based on something in us, but based on Christ alone. Now, he leads us to a second thing, because people look at this verse and they say, well, I don't know how this verse is in harmony with James Chapter 2, verse 24, I think it's up there. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Now, this might seem like a contradiction when we come to James' epistle. Paul's teaching doesn't contradict James, I want to tell you that. Paul knows and teaches that faith must be accompanied by love, by obedience, but our love is not the means of God's saving grace. It's the result of God's saving grace. 
our obedience is not the means of God saving grace. It's the result of God saving grace. I've said it twice because I want to make that emphasis. If you don't get this thinking right, then you'll miss one of the greatest and most precious truths of the Christian faith. Paul says justification is by faith alone. James says justification is by faith and works. Now, you might argue that someone has got this a little bit, uh, got their wires crossed here, and, and one of the two must be wrong. And sometimes people will choose Paul, and sometimes they'll choose James. And then sometimes people say, Paul says justification is by faith, and James says it's by faith and works. Therefore, what we need to do is to put them together so that justification is by faith and works. Well, this solution, this statement, this interpretation is wrong. Romans 3.28, which I read before, it says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Of course, we've just read now in James 2.24, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. So how do you explain this? Well, you explain it by looking at the context. Paul is talking about how a person is accepted by God. He's dealing with the issue of how unrighteous people can be accepted by a righteous God. So how can an unrighteous people be accepted by a righteous God? Paul is specifically dealing with this issue of the way that we are justified, the way that we are declared righteous, the way that we are pardoned, the way that we are accepted. And he makes it clear that we're accepted first by what God does. Secondly, that we receive the benefit of what God does, not by doing something, but simply by trusting, simply by receiving by faith. And that's a gift. That's how we, we are justified. James, however, is talking about something else. James, in his writing, in, his, in the context of his writing, he's addressing the church and he's addressing the issue of hypocrisy. James is speaking to some people who claim to believe, who claim to be Christians, but in their lives, you can't see the fruit of their profession. So how do you sort that out? How do you tell the difference between a person who claims to be a Christian but isn't, a person who claims to be a Christian and is? How do you know whether a person really believes? What demonstrates their Christianity? Well, James' answer is clear. Faith brings forth the fruit of holiness. James says it's faith and obedience, faith and holiness that demonstrates a person to be a believer. So James is not contradicting what Paul says. James is dealing with a different subject. Paul is dealing with how one is made right before God. James is dealing with the sin of hypocrisy. If we look at James 2, verse 14, it says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? James highlights the situation of a person who claims to be a believer but doesn't live like one. It's the issue of hypocrisy. And James is raising this question concerning hypocrisy. Paul, when he's what he's dealing with, he's not dealing with the issue of hypocrisy. He's dealing with the issue of how we are saved. Secondly, James does not ask the question, can faith alone really save a person? This isn't what James is talking about. He's not asking, can real faith by itself save a person? Or do, do we need to have real faith and works to save a person? That's not James's question. James is asking, can claim faith demonstrate a person to be really a Christian? That's the question that James is asking. Not can faith alone save you, but can a claimed faith really demonstrate that a person is a believer? Well, 
What if someone says he has faith or she has faith? Now, notice what, Paul, what James says. James didn't say, what if a person has faith but doesn't have works? That's not what James said. He said, what if a man says he has faith? James is focusing on the spoken confession of someone who professes to have faith being contradicted by a lie. Verse 14, he asks, he asks, can that kind of faith save him? Notice that James didn't ask, can faith save him? He asked, can that kind of faith, what kind of faith? Plain faith that shows no reality with that person's profession. James isn't talking about how a person is saved. James is talking about how you know a real Christian from a false Christian. And thirdly, James is mainly concerned in this passage about dead faith. James uses the term dead faith. Uh, he uses it twice in this chapter. What does he mean by dead faith? He's referring to a faith that which is empty or hollow. It doesn't have a living reality. There's a verbal profession, but there's no reality of life in the heart of the believer. There's no deeds which are in accordance with faith. And James is clearly concerned about people making a profession but show no signs of the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. Fourthly, notice the argument that James uses to cap off his point. He goes right to the story of Abraham. Now, that's interesting because Paul goes there as well. He goes there in, in Romans 4, which we'll start to look at next time. Paul goes to the story of Abraham to prove justification by faith alone. James goes to the story of Abraham and to this very same passage that Paul goes to to prove that faith without a life, which is in accordance with faith, without deeds, without obedience, without love, is not real faith. He goes through the same story. But notice what he does. He quotes from Genesis 15, 16, which says, Abraham believed God, the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. James uh, says very similarly in, in, chap in verses 22 to 23 in chapter 2, you see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did and the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. This means that Abraham was justified when he offered up Isaac, his son. So James is not contradicting Paul. However, God says to Abraham that he was justified by faith before Isaac was even born. When did Abraham offer Isaac up? Years and years later. James, who knows this passage well, he, he, James, of course, was a good Jewish Christian who knew Genesis, knows about God's declaration that Abraham is righteous, which came seven chapters before Abraham offered up by Isaac when you read the book of Genesis. Therefore, James isn't talking about God's acceptance of Abraham talking about Abraham's demonstration that he does belong to God. So James isn't contradicting the Apostle Paul. Now let's return now to Romans 3. Paul makes it clear that he not only knows that faith must be accompanied by obedience, he teaches it himself. What's the very last verse in our passage today in verse 31? Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Paul knows that faith and obedience go hand in hand in the Christian life. Paul also knows that our obedience has nothing to do whatsoever with God's pre-justification. And he wants us to hold these two truths together. Does God call us to obedience as Christians? Certainly, yes. Does our obedience have anything to do what's, does it have anything to do whatsoever with God's acceptance of us? Certain or definitely no. And if we get this wrong, we get everything wrong. 
when there are conditions in any human relationship. It severs the capacity for intimacy in that relationship. And how much more in our relationship with our trying God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. If you're obeying because you're afraid of God rejecting you, then you're obeying out of ungodly fear. For if you are the beloved, God has accepted you through his son and your obedience is not counted in order to get, in order to get God to like you, to get him to love you, to get him to save you. Go back to Exodus chapter 20, verse 2. Is this chapter familiar to you? Exodus chapter 20, of course, is the giving of the Lord's where we read, first read in the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments. Before the Ten Commandments are given, it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. God doesn't say here in the Ten Commandments that if you obey them or if you really try hard to obey them, then I will bring you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. This isn't what God says. God says, I have brought you out of the land of Egypt. I have brought you out of the land of slavery. I have redeemed you. I have bought you with a price. Now obey me. He doesn't say obey me. Then I'll save you. Paul is emphasising when he says justification is by faith alone, that we are redeemed, we are saved for obedience, not redeemed or saved by obedience. My obedience and your obedience isn't a condition to receive the love of, the love of God. He already loves us much more than we can ever know. And our obedience flows from that love which we have received and which we receive the benefits of his justification by faith alone and not by any works that we can do. Well, this is the greatest news ever told. I probably haven't told it very well today. But this is the greatest news ever told. And there's no other religion in the world that has anything like this that we are saved, we are justified, we, we are declared righteous by our faith in Christ as a gift given to us. Friends, what a wonderful gospel we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope we all come to appreciate that and to love the gospel as we come to love our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you pray with me? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this simple truth that we are declared righteous because of the faith that you've given us to believe what Jesus did for us when he died on the cross. Lord, we just pray that you'll help each one of us to understand this truth to understand this personally, that you would speak to our hearts and bring us to that point where we can truly believe. Lord, give us that gift of faith to believe, each one of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'll uh, introduce the next hymn and then Dave will come back.